Hey everybody, it's Lon Sybin and it's time for your weekly wrap up and we've got a bunch of stuff to cover today including a PAX East recap, Chromebook updates after five years, Apple ditching Intel, Intel NUC and the Netflix 4K with the new Gemini Lake processor and the best way to consume my new podcast and probably some other stuff too. So let's get into it. And I want to begin first by thanking our newest members here on the channel, including Mark, Thomas Baining, and Robert Hausbahn. I want to thank them and everyone who's been contributing on an ongoing basis to the channel, along with everyone who watches and subscribes to the channel as well, because all of those things equal channel growth. Now, we don't have an advertiser on the channel this week, but we've got another non-ad, an affiliate link for a service I haven't talked about in a while, which is Audible. Uh, they provide audio books, and they are exceptionally well-produced, and uh, I do like to listen to audio books because I don't have as much time to read anymore, but I still want to uh, consume some really good stuff. I like a lot of nonfiction books, and uh, surprisingly, the only fiction I listen to on Audible are Star Wars novels, and uh, the latest one I'm listening to right now is The Last Jedi. Uh, this is, of course, based on the screenplay, but it has a lot of detail in it that was missing or cut out of the movie. And I found it to be a really uh, neat way to kind of fill in some of the holes and questions you might have in the film. I really liked the movie, some didn't, and that's okay, but uh, this is really enhancing the film, actually. If you go and watch the movie, listen to the book, and then go back to the movie, you'll probably get uh, a little more of an appreciation of what they put together there. What's cool about the novel is that they kind of do it like an audio play, a radio play, if you will. Uh, Mark Thompson narrates this as he does many other Star Wars books, and he does a lot of different character voices. There are sound effects. It's really a, a great way to uh, get more out of these films, and he does a lot of the other Star Wars novels that kind of lead into the films as well. So definitely worth a listen and worth trying out. You get a free book if you go to that link down below. What's nice is that on their monthly plan, typically your monthly subscription cost is less than the cost of the book if you were to buy it without being a monthly subscriber. So good deal, uh, definitely worth checking out over at Audible. So let's take a look now at the Week in Review. On the Extras channel, I unboxed an LG 24-inch 4K IPS monitor that I got for less than 300 bucks. I needed something new uh, to stick on the desk here that would fit, and this certainly fits. I needed to uh, do a little more with 4K now that most devices are supporting it, and I wanted a way to do that without having to lug everything over to the uh, TV over there for the production of new videos. So uh, you'll be able to see that review coming up in a couple of days. I also unboxed the new Lenovo Thunderbolt 3 graphics dock. In fact, I have it on the desk right here. And uh, what this little device does is uh, not only provide you with a Thunderbolt 3 dock and all the things we've talked about with docking mechanisms in the past, but it also has a GPU built in, a GTX 1050. So I'm just wrapping up my evaluation on this and hopefully a little later in the week, you'll all get a chance to see what that is all about. It's a little more uh, complicated to get working than I anticipated, but I will cover all of that in the main review. Now on the main channel, we had a bunch of stuff go up this week. Uh, two things that were not reviews, but I think were very well received by the viewership. The first was uh, my look at the 90s internet and what it looked like. And I was using that uh, Raspberry Pi I reviewed about two weeks ago to kind of drive that 90s internet interface. It was actually a lot of fun to set up. It was kind of a weekend project for me. And I said, I can make a fun video out of this. And it looks like a lot of you enjoyed that. We had our first official episode of the podcast where I reviewed or interviewed uh, RetroArch's Hunter Collar about uh, that great open source platform for game emulation. If you haven't checked it out yet, definitely check it out in audio form or uh, here on the YouTube channel. I reviewed a tiny little PC from Zotac called the Pi 225. Nice little PC there. And I also reviewed the new ThinkPad X1 Carbon, uh, which is a higher-end laptop, but I like to look at those every once in a while, especially if I can get one in on loan from a company, which Lenovo uh, did for us. So uh, that was good stuff, and you can check out that review in the master playlist down below. And now it's time for a couple of things that are on my mind, and this is week 57 of me doing this as a full-time occupation. And uh, yesterday, I was at PAX East for the whole day. I participated on a panel discussion with my friend Ken Gagne and a few other new friends talking about Patreon and how you might uh, get started with crowdfunding for your creative efforts. It was a, actually a pretty well-attended panel discussion, uh, which was great to see. They often have some really good panels at PAX. 
I was on that panel with Tanya DePas, who is from I Need Diverse Games, along with Ken and another great guy, Ian Danskin, uh, who you can find there on the links on screen. I'm going to have an audio version of this panel up in my podcast feed in the coming weeks, so stay tuned for that. And it was a good, uh, good discussion, actually, and I had a good time doing it. I do like going to these conferences. PAX is a little harder to cover, though, and I'll show you what I mean by that here, because uh, it is just, there's just so many people there, it's hard to get on the floor and see stuff. So uh, this was the scene when I arrived. Uh, surprisingly, the screening doesn't take as long as it looks. They were really very efficient at going through bags. Uh, they had a special area for cosplayers to bring their weapons to to make sure they were not real. But you can just see how many people are there. This was the Sunday crowd uh, in the morning, and uh, it's just so hard to get in front of different things. But they've got a lot of stuff you can do. There's something for everybody. They got PC gaming that you can see here. Uh, this was the Player Unknown Battlegrounds section. They had some more PC gaming going on over in this section. Uh, they had a few other rooms where there were, you know, console free plays and other PC gaming experiences. I went to a panel on uh, the 90s golden age of uh, gaming and Pat Country, one of my favorite podcasters and YouTubers, was there uh, along with another guy named Scott Miller, uh, who was is still the head of uh, 3D Realm Software, who's the maker of Duke Nukem and many other games. I knew them as Apogee, and back in the early 90s, like around the time I was a freshman in high school, uh, I was a beta tester for them, but I used to have to dial into a bulletin board system in Texas to get all the latest builds and submit my feedback. So I didn't last all that long as a beta tester because my mom was not happy with the long distance phone bill uh, that went along with that. But I did get to meet him and let him know that I was a beta tester for him and we might try to get him on a podcast episode in the future at some point. So that was a lot of fun uh, going to that panel. I also got to meet Pat finally too, which was great. One thing that I noticed quite a bit at this show, and this is true of a few years back as well, is that there's a good emphasis on independent games. In fact, they have a whole pavilion for uh, independent developers and some of the independent game publishers to show off what they're doing. And uh, what's been really neat to see is Nintendo beginning to adopt this more. Uh, obviously, PlayStation has a lot of indie games along with the Xbox, but uh, the Switch is, I think, a really good target platform for a lot of these games because they're not all that hardware intensive most of the time. And uh, the Switch, of course, adds portability, which is lacking in the PC and Xbox and PlayStation 4 world. So Nintendo dedicated a good chunk of their booth uh, to these independent games. Here are a few others that I found of interest here. Uh, this, by the way, is the indie mega booth where all of these uh, groups were, or these gamers and developers were centralized. You could try out a lot of these games and it wasn't too busy over there, so you could do that. Uh, this game is called The Messenger, which I thought was kind of fun. It looks like Ninja Ga Gaiden from back in the NES days. Uh, Steam, of course, is still a very big driver of game traffic and a lot of people were hoping you would wishlist them on Steam for their upcoming games. This one looked pretty cool. This is Floor Kids. It's a rhythm game uh, where you do a little dance-off competition with uh, other players or perhaps the computer to try to win here. I think you tap these targets first and then your player uh, kind of executes the stuff as they go. Great music, a lot of fun. This is called Trail Makers where you design little buggies to uh, accomplish stunts and feats. You have flying ones, of course, that you can design with different parts. Uh, kind of like Besiege, I think. That's a game that's kind of similar to this, but uh, this one is just uh, kind of a dune buggy uh, kind of approach. And then, of course, Shaq Fu is back. In fact, um, Ken was telling me, Ken Gagney, who I went to the show with, uh, mentioned to me that one of their marketing pitches here is that the game doesn't suck like it used to. And then the big AAA titles were there. This whole area of Sony's booth was dedicated to one game, this Detroit uh, uh, game that they're coming out with at some point in the future. And it's amazing just how much money uh, these game companies, the big ones like Microsoft and Sony, uh, spend to be at these shows and bringing in all this stuff. I mean, they've got like these old lamp posts that they set up there to add some ambiance to their booth at this particular show. And in the video game world, there's a show like every other week. Uh, one of the cool things with PAX, though, is that it is more democratized in that it's not a, a show designed for the press. It's designed for the gamers. So when you go there uh, as a gamer or as a member of the press, for the most part, uh, you're not going to, as a, as a press member or a special guest speaker, uh, you're not going to get access to things that everyone else can't get access to. Uh, that's changing a little bit. There are some exclusive things for streamers to do and whatnot, but generally it's been a very open show where everyone exhibiting is accessible to everyone that is there. Uh, so if you are a gamer and you have one of these PAX shows near you, I think you'll get a lot out of it because you can go through and get a lot of uh, you know, little uh, investigations into some of the new gaming stuff that might 
might be out there. Uh, the challenge, though, is that it is so crowded and it's really hard to get in front of the more popular stuff. But uh, I really found a, a lot of value out of looking at that independent booth area just because I like the indie games and it's good to see them have a sizable presence at the show. And now it's time for some things in the news that caught my eye this week. The first is the uh, end, it looks like, of the five-year support window for a number of older Chromebooks. Uh, there's a great article on Lilliputing that kind of puts this issue into perspective. And uh, right now, I don't think there are any Chromebooks that might be completely done with their support, but a lot of them are getting to that point. And when they hit that, apparently they're not going to get updated anymore, which of course leads us to some security concerns and other things. And it's not really clear about what Google is going to do about these Chromebooks now, because I think the lifespan on these uh, is longer perhaps than they anticipated when they first announced that uh, five-year support guarantee. So I'm uh, eager to see how this pans out. Uh, my mother has a Chromebook that I gave her about three and a half or four years ago, which is still perfectly adequate for her needs. It's Intel powered. It does everything she needs to do. And I'm concerned what will happen with these fully functional and perfectly fine Chromebooks after their support window closes. Uh, this is one of those balancing acts between a low-cost computer and the cost of long-term support and development. So again, we'll have to see how it pans out. My prediction is that perhaps some of these older ARM processors may not fare as well as some of the older Intel-based devices, but we'll have to see what comes of this, something we'll keep an eye on and let me know what you hear. And Bloomberg reported last week that Apple might be planning to ditch Intel and switch over to its own chips starting in 2020. And this kind of fuels some speculation that I've been following over the years that uh, Apple would basically merge iOS and Mac OS into a single entity. Probably a smart thing to do given how much more market share Apple has on their mobile devices versus their computing devices. I'm sure it's costing the company a lot. Not that they don't have an issue with money, but it's probably costing them a lot to have a computer like the Mac, which has very low market share to something like the iPad and iPhone, which have much larger uh, install bases and market share. If they could get everything working on the same platform, uh, that might be something of benefit to Apple's profit margins in the future, make them uh, retain even more money than they are now. And I think it might be the direction the company goes in. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed in Apple marketing is that they've been marketing the iPad as the anti-computer, uh, partly because the iPad does consumer-based computing tasks exceptionally well. In fact, for a lot of photo editing, uh, I, I stopped my Adobe Creative uh, subscription and used my iPad uh, with a few apps on there with the pencil. I can uh, more easily pull things out of images, for example, because I can use a uh, pencil versus a mouse and the speed and performance of it is very good. And that's because these chips that Apple uses on their iPads and iPhones are geared to those activities. They're optimized for that. I couldn't do 3D modeling, perhaps, or an engineering application on an iPad as well as I could on a high-powered PC, but uh, perhaps Apple is looking at where their consumers are using their devices, and if they can provide something that is thinner, lighter, cheaper, fanless, with better battery life, uh, and a higher profit margin, I think they're going to do that. So we might see uh, what you can do on a Mac change as this might occur. And this, of course, will uh, result in many controversies as things move forward. But we're also seeing Windows run on ARM processors now. I hope to get some PCs in over the course of the year that are running on ARM. And we're seeing now these uh, lower powered, lower cost chips starting to perform better to the point where it might be enough for a consumer. Certainly, we've seen that with Chromebooks as well. So Intel's got some challenges ahead here because they do make very high-powered processors, but consumers are not needing all that horsepower anymore, at least in uh, general computing areas, more so for specialized areas. So we're going to see what happens here, but keep an eye on this story. Last item here is Silicon Dust, a, an occasional sponsor here on the channel, uh, had an announcement this week that uh, they are now supporting DRM-protected content on the iPhone and iPad for live TV watching. It doesn't yet work with the DVR system, and if you have the DVR installed, uh, you will not be able to play those DRM protected channels because it's going through the recording engine first. But if you are just using the uh, HD Home Run Prime without the DVR, uh, you'll be able to now watch HBO and other DRM protected channels on your iOS devices. And now it's time for a Q&A from you, the viewers. And our first question comes in from Dan Michaels in regards to the new Gemini Lake processors that are in these new Intel NUCs and a number of other mini PCs I am sure we'll be seeing very shortly here on the channel. And what he's wondering is whether or not these new NUCs are going to support 
uh, 4K playback in Netflix because this is something that if you have a more expensive KB Lake Intel device you can do, uh, but it's really uncertain as to how these mini PCs were going to perform. So I've got some news for you. I've been doing a little testing here and sure enough, the uh, NUC here on the desk is able to play with the Netflix app running in Windows uh, Ultra HD 4K. Uh, but it did not do that when I initially loaded in the Netflix app. There was an additional step that I had to do, which I will detail for you right now. Uh, so the first thing you need to do on your new Gemini Lake NUC is go over to the link you see here on screen. Uh, this will bring you to the Microsoft Store. Oddly enough, I was not able to get to this page on the store by searching, so using the link is where you have to go. This is a Microsoft-provided extension for HEVC video. Uh, if your computer is compatible with it, it will install. And then hopefully after you get that install and reload the Netflix app, uh, you will see this Ultra HD 4K. You do need to use the Netflix app. You have to actually be in that app for this to work, but uh, you will be able to, again, uh, enjoy your Netflix at Ultra HD 4K on a Gemini Lake processor. At least I was able to, so that was a good thing. Uh, before that extension installed, the best it gave me was HD. So after the extension got in, uh, the DRM was working out, and I could then get this to work. Now, this is on the NUC. I don't know if other manufacturers might uh, not may, may not get a license or something. I don't know how that's all going to work. So I will keep testing this as these new PCs come out, just to let you know which ones work and which ones don't. Uh, but one thing that doesn't work and will not work is HDR video. I went on the Intel NUC forums and said, hey, I need a definitive answer here because my viewers want to know, uh, will the uh, new Gemini Lake NUCs, both this lower end one and the new one that's coming out in the next couple of days, will those support HDR? Because the marketing materials indicated that they did. There were actually two conflicting answers on the forum. And unfortunately, the response from Intel is that uh, these Gemini Lake NUCs will not support HDR video, period, end of story. It looks like it may have been possible. Perhaps it is possible on this chipset, but at least on these NUCs, it is not supported. So I'll be keeping an eye on this for other uh, Gemini Lake machines as they start coming out uh, to see if that's the case across the entire chipset or if it's just a decision Intel uh, made here on these NUCs. Uh, these two points will be integrated into a NUC update video I hope to do later this week. So you get a sneak preview of that as a weekly wrap-up viewer. And Dan's question came in via my Facebook group, which you can find at lon.tv slash Facebook group. We've got 200 plus people in there now, and we're having a lot of great conversations about all of the technology that we talk about here on the channel. And uh, the best part for me is that a lot of you are starting to engage with each other, which is something that I think the YouTube comment system doesn't do well at. So it's been great to just have a place for all of us to go that's active. Uh, and I'm able to post things there and get some feedback from all of you. And we're having a lot of good conversations in there. So definitely check it out. And this next set of questions comes in from Saturn Otaku and Ramon Dave Rede. Uh, they're asking about the new podcast and what's the best way for the channel to benefit from your listenership of that. Now, I have an audio podcast feed that you can find at lon.tv slash podcast. I'm on just about every major uh, podcasting application right now. And I am totally fine with you downloading that a podcast in audio format from my podcast link because I do have uh, analytics that I can track on there. I am uh, in using uh, PodTrack analytics for that. PodTrack, it's P-O-D-T-R-A-C, uh, is an ad network that uh, looks for popular podcasts and begins placing ads on those podcasts. And the analytics they use are not tied to individual users, so they don't know what you're doing, just that something was downloaded and uh, they know the client and the general geography of the listener, but that's about it. Uh, and that's been a really good platform for me just because I can track and see that my podcast uh, listenership uh, is growing, which is exactly what I want to do. If you are a YouTube Red subscriber, there are some monetization benefits for the channel uh, in that YouTube Red compensates for watch time. So the longer you watch and the more of your attention is focused on this channel, for example, uh, I am compensated, I think, for just, the, just about every minute that you listen or watch to uh, with a Red subscription. So certainly in the short term, there's more uh, monetization benefits for me if you are a YouTube Red subscriber consuming the podcast there. Uh, likewise, if you are a uh, regular YouTube watcher without a Red subscription and there's an ad that goes up before the video, 
Uh, the usual ad compensation applies there as well. Uh, one of the cool things with YouTube Red, and this was the subject of Saturn's question, is that uh, you can download videos from YouTube with the YouTube app as a Red subscriber, and it doesn't penalize me at all for you doing that. If you were using an, you know, an unofficial downloader, it certainly does because I don't get compensated for that. But uh, YouTube Red subscribers have their watch time minutes tracked uh, if you download and watch offline. So I guess after you finish watching and you're back on the internet, uh, the app will report back to YouTube and let them know how many watch time uh, minutes you had on that particular video, again, even if it was downloaded. Another cool feature of YouTube Red is that you can listen to audio in the background. So you can leave the app, if you're a Red subscriber, on iOS and Android, and the audio of that video will continue playing in the background. I do that quite a bit with a lot of my favorite creators, especially if they're just doing conversational content like this. Uh, I can listen to that and have the peace of mind of knowing that my Red subscription is still benefiting that creator as I listen offline and do other things with it. So YouTube Red is really good. Um, it's, it's certainly uh, maybe not as good as a direct contribution via my support page, but uh, it is much better than just relying on ad revenue because again, you're compensated for every minute of content consumed. Now these next two questions are a representative sample of something I'm hearing more and more from viewers on my disclaimers. And I don't know why people can't understand what I mean when I say no one has reviewed this content before I uploaded it. I think a majority of viewers understand that nobody has uh, approved what you're about to see beyond me before that video gets uploaded to YouTube because that is exactly what that statement is about. However, more and more people are hearing that statement and thinking that I am making some declaration that I am the first person on YouTube to review a particular product. This is certainly not the case, and that is not what I mean by that statement. And uh, the reason why I make that statement is because it's important for you to know uh, what influences might have been there in the production of content. Uh, this is very important for channels like mine that do take sponsored content so that you, the viewer, know exactly where I'm coming from and what my relationships are. So for example, when I review something like the uh, Intel NUC here, uh, I bought this with my own funds and I'm giving you my opinion of it. But if I'm going to give you my opinion, I want you to know that nobody had any influence over that opinion because there are times when I do a sponsored video uh, where perhaps the sponsor wants to see the video before it's uploaded. In fact, more than 95% of my sponsored videos have that relationship. The only uh, exception uh, to that have been the sponsored videos that I do for Plex, where they don't need to see the video first before it goes up. But in most cases, a sponsor who's paying for something wants to be able to make sure the product they are getting is what they ask for. Uh, and that's why I grant them that opportunity to see it before it goes up. But I also tell you uh, that somebody has reviewed this before it was uploaded so that you know that uh, there was a relationship and, and some uh, partnership here in the development of that piece of content. However, on my editorial stuff, we don't have that. And I feel it's very important that if I am telling you somebody's influencing me in one video, uh, you should also know when people are not influencing me. And that is, again, uh, why I make that disclaimer. So I'm just trying to figure out why people keep getting confused by that. Uh, I'm trying different ways of saying it, and I'm still getting uh, comments like this. Again, it's a minority of viewers. It's not everybody, but uh, there's enough people that are misinterpreting this statement that I do need to work on it better. So my Q&A for you this week is maybe some suggestions as to how we can uh, improve that statement so less people misinterpret it. I think to some degree, some of them might be younger viewers that don't quite understand what I'm getting at. Uh, there also could be issues with people who are not speaking English as their first language and might be misinterpreting what I am saying. Or perhaps what we're seeing here is the uh, YouTube automatic translation feature totally botching uh, the words that I'm using here, which might lead a viewer reading on the subtitles to get something different than what I intended. So anyway, I just got to figure this out and I'd love to get uh, some feedback from all of you on that because I do think enough people are being confused by this statement that I need to clarify it better so that everyone understands exactly what I am saying when I make my important disclaimers on my videos here. And our channel of the week this week comes from the Smoke Monster. And this is a channel you'll want to check out if you are someone who likes the Super Nintendo and has an SD to SNES flash cartridge because over the last couple of weeks, a new project has emerged to allow you to now emulate 
the Super FX chip on that flash cartridge. This is a huge development, something a lot of people, myself included, have been waiting for that cartridge to do uh, for years, and it's now here. And what he's been doing on his YouTube channel is testing out uh, all the different ROMs that are out there to see how they interact with this new uh, piece of software for your, your flash cartridge. This is a very big moment right now in uh, the SNES world, and if you are interested in that kind of thing, uh, Smoke Monster has got some comprehensive testing going on on his website. Uh, he's also known for helping people organize their ROM sets for their emulation activities because uh, many ROMs have been hacked and modified over the years, and uh, he developed a way of, first of all, organizing your ROM files properly, but also making sure the ROMs you have are actually legitimate uh, duplications, perhaps, of the originals and not something that's been messed with over the years. So uh, you can definitely check out some of the work that he's done on GitHub around that as well. Uh, great stuff from the Smoke Monster. So this week on the channel, we've got a couple of things that talk about. Uh, the first is we're going to take a look at the uh, Lenovo graphics dock that I talked about a little bit earlier. I'm almost done testing it, so you'll get my opinion on that very shortly. We're going to look, hopefully, at that LG 4K monitor that is sitting right here on the desk next to me. That's going to be a fun one to look at. I really wanted something small that could fit on the desk, yet was 4K 60 hertz capable. And so far, it passed that test, but I'll give you all the details on how it works in that review. Uh, we also are going to come back to our Intel NUC review that I did recently uh, to look at a few things that viewers wanted to see, namely that 4K and HDR question, which I just answered. I'll answer again in that video. We're going to look at two other emulators that some viewers wanted to see and also look at its power consumption. I'm also getting in the other version of this NUC that has the faster processor. Again, also Gemini Lake, but uh, a quad core versus a dual core. So that one's coming in hopefully sometime this week or next as soon as it gets here, we'll hustle and get that uh, review up for you, so stay tuned for that. And we're also going to begin a sponsored series from the Mocha Foundation. Uh, this is a product that I like quite a bit. It's a means of uh, using your cable television wiring in your home to extend your network, and we're going to do some comparisons with uh, conducting that same activity via Wi-Fi mesh. Uh, the first video is going to be focused on gamers and getting the best network performance out of an extended network. And we'll be doing a bunch of benchmarks and looking at how Mocha might be a better solution for running that backhaul uh, to your router. So again, we'll be uh, doing a sponsored post here. And again, this is another product that I use quite a bit and think is a very good solution for folks. Now, if you want to help support the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv slash support and make, and make a monthly or a one-time contribution to the channel. We also have our ongoing relationship with Plex, where if you sign up for a Plex account, no credit card required, we get a small commission for that. We also get a commission if you go to uh, get a Plex Pass subscription or gift a Plex Pass subscription to somebody else. It's a great media serving application. We've got some other channels to check out. The Extras channel, where I unbox stuff and do supplementary content. The podcast, which I talked about earlier, can be found at lon.tv slash podcast. We have the Stippage channel where I pull out search-friendly bits of this video and many others that I do. And my live stream archive is at lon.tv slash live streams. We do live stuff from time to time here on the channel as well. You can get notified whenever I do something by clicking on that notification bell. So you'll get pushed a notification on your phone via email and also I think through a browser notification if you have those enabled. So uh, definitely do that if you like what I do here. And of course, we have ways to engage with the channel. My email list where I update you occasionally on uh, big channel news that I want you to know about. The Facebook page is at lon.tv slash Facebook, but I also uh, get a lot more activity out of my Facebook group, uh, which you can find at lon.tv slash Facebook group. And of course, we've got the store at lon.tv slash store. Now, if you want to know every time I add something to the store, you can go to lon.tv slash store alert to get a notification as to when I add products to the store. Right now I'm using the Square Store, but I'm about to move off of that platform because they really failed me as a customer. I'll talk a little bit more about that. I'm trying to work something out with them, but uh, right now it's not working. So if you know of other online uh, sales platforms that I can use, please let me know down in the comments below because I've kind of had it with them and I'm ready to move on, unfortunately. But uh, for now, we'll be using Square as a platform, but I am leaving there very shortly due to some fraud that they did not detect and I lost a bunch of money on that, unfortunately. So that's going to do it for this week's weekly wrap-up. I want to thank everyone who contributes to this channel on a regular basis, either through subscribing or uh, contributing via the many platform options we have for that, as well as everyone who 
comments and watches, all of those things equal channel growth. And again, I really thank everyone for your continued support. More to come this week, so stay tuned. This is Lon Seidman, and thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including gold level supporters of the Black Eyed and Blues Music Hour podcast, Chris Allegretta, and Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.